Discovered in 2003, Homo floresiensis is one of the most controversial members of the hominin family. Standing at just 3 feet 6 inches tall, this ancient human is the smallest to ever be discovered and the most confusing, as its size was not the only surprise it had for scientists. But what was Homo floresiensis? Why were they so small? And how did this simple hobbit discovery take scientists all over the world on an unexpected journey? The story of the Homo floresiensis discovery started in September 2003, when archaeologist Mike Morwood and a joint team of Australian and Indonesian archaeologists set out to unravel the mysteries of early human migration in the Liang Bua Cave on the Indonesian island of Flores. Their primary objective was to study the migration patterns of early humans from Asia to Australia, positing that the ancient Indonesian islands served as crucial stepping stones in this ancient journey. However, their expedition took an extraordinary turn with the unearthing of a discovery that would captivate the scientific community and ignite imaginations worldwide, the remains of a previously unknown human species. The first specimen unearthed was designated LB1 and became a focal point of intense study and fascination. LB1 was remarkable for its small stature, standing just over one meter tall, and its cranial capacity which was significantly smaller than that of modern humans. This initial discovery included a relatively complete skeleton with a partially preserved skull, offering a rare glimpse into the physical characteristics of this elusive hominin. The small size and unique features of LB1 suggested a species that had evolved in isolation, raising questions about its origins and evolutionary path. The story, however, deepened over the next 12 months as further excavations in the Liangbua cave revealed more remains. In total, about 15 incomplete skeletons were unearthed, including various teeth, arm and leg bones, feet, fingers, hips and shoulders. Among these, the discovery of a skull belonging to a female individual affectionately dubbed the Little Lady of Flores stood out. She was estimated to be around 30 years old at the time of her death and her remains provided additional evidence of the unique morphology of the species. In 2004, anthropologist Peter Brown officially described and named the new species Homo floresiensis in honor of the island of Flores where the remains were found. The most striking feature of the species was its diminutive size, which quickly earned it the nickname Hobbit after the small statured characters from J.R.R. Tolkien's beloved literary works. The fascinating thing about this species is that it stood out due to its tiny stature and cranial capacity. Additionally, an abundance of stone tools was discovered within the cave that seemed to be tailored to the proportions of a one meter tall individual. Radiocarbon dating of these tools places these artifacts within a time frame spanning from 95,000 to 13,000 years ago, meaning they existed with other hominins like the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and many others. The discovery of Homo floresiensis was a big deal as it challenged existing theories about human evolution and migration, suggesting a far more complex and varied history than previously understood. Beyond this fascination, this new species created chaos in the scientific community as everyone had a theory they believed to be true. When it came to anatomy, the Homo floresiensis was unlike anything scientists had ever seen before. With an average height of just over one meter, they exhibit significantly reduced stature compared to other members of the genus Homo. This diminutive size is accompanied by robust limb bones, particularly in the lower extremities, suggesting adaptations for terrestrial locomotion and possibly climbing. Their long, flat feet with short toes further indicated adaptations to navigate the rugged terrain of Flores. Moving on to their cranial characteristics, Cranial analysis revealed a small cranial capacity in Homo floresiensis, estimated to be around 400 cubic centimeters, which is substantially smaller than that of modern humans and other contemporary hominins. Despite this reduced brain size, evidence of sophisticated tool use and fire control suggests cognitive abilities comparable to those of other early Homo species. Their facial morphology included distinct features such as large teeth, the absence of a chin, and broad nasal apertures, indicating a unique craniofacial profile within the genus Homo. Still on the face, the dental analysis of Homo floresiensis revealed large teeth relative to their cranial size, 
indicative of specific dietary adaptations or feeding behaviors. There was also the absence of certain dental features typical of modern humans, such as a chin. This absence suggests a different pattern of masticatory loading and possibly dietary specialization. Further analysis showed that stable isotope analysis of fossil teeth indicated a mixed diet of plant and animal resources. A deeper examination of limb morphology and joint structure suggests that Homo floresiensis had a unique walking pattern characterized by high steps due to their knee joint morphology. This distinctive walk, likely influenced by their shorter stature and robust limb proportions, reflected specific adaptations they gained over the years to navigate the challenging terrain of Flores, especially its dense forests and rocky landscapes. Essentially, Homo floresiensis was a challenge to scientists worldwide, and it wouldn't take long before it would cause chaos in the scientific community. Furthermore, genetic and morphological evidence suggests a closer relationship to earlier Homo species than to modern humans, reinforcing the notion of Homo floresiensis as a separate lineage within the human evolutionary tree. After the discovery of Homo floresiensis, the scientific community was thrown into a flurry of scientific debate. Archaeologist Mike Morwood and his team, who discovered the remains of Flores Island, believe they belong to a new species called Homo floresiensis, and even proposed that these ancient humans might have lived alongside modern humans. However, not everyone agreed. One prominent theory, championed by Dr. Robert D. Martin and Dr. Jorgen Weber, proposed that the small brain and stature of Homo floresiensis could be attributed to microcephaly. This condition, characterized by underdeveloped brains and skulls, seemed like a plausible explanation for the diminutive size of the LB1 specimen. Supporters of this theory pointed to comparative studies with modern human microcephalic skulls and highlighted certain morphological features shared between LB1 and individuals with microcephaly. However, this theory faced criticism as subsequent studies revealed that the overall morphology of Homo floresiensis, including its limb proportions and wrist bones, did not align with those of microcephalic Homo sapiens. Furthermore, the distinct shape of LB1's brain case suggested a divergence from the characteristics of microcephalic humans, pointing to a more nuanced explanation for its unique morphology. Another idea, suggested by a group of researchers in 2007, was that Homo floresiensis might be modern humans afflicted with Laron syndrome, a genetic condition resulting in dwarfism and small brains. Statistical correlations between certain cranial and postcranial measurements of LB1 and individuals with Laron syndrome seem to lend support to this theory. However, Critics countered that the comprehensive set of morphological features observed in Homo floresiensis, including dental structure and limb morphology, did not align with the characteristics of Laron syndrome. Additionally, the absence of genetic markers of Laron syndrome in the Homo floresiensis specimens further weakened this hypothesis. Other pathological conditions, such as congenital iodine deficiency syndrome and Down syndrome, were also considered but ultimately lacked consistent morphological evidence linking Homo floresiensis to these conditions. Despite these challenges, the prevailing consensus among paleoanthropologists favored the classification of Homo floresiensis as a distinct species that underwent insular dwarfism, a process where species on isolated islands evolve smaller body sizes due to limited resources and isolation. Support for this view came from extensive morphological analyses of skeletal remains, which consistently revealed a unique combination of features distinct from both modern humans and Homo erectus. Studies in 2007 looked at bones from the hand and found they were similar to those of chimpanzees or very early humans, not like modern human bones. Other studies on the arm, shoulder, and leg bones also showed similarities to early humans and apes. Later research in 2009 supported the idea that H. floresiensis was a different species from Homo sapiens, based on their body sizes and family tree analysis. Furthermore, genetic and morphological evidence suggests a closer relationship to earlier Homo species than to modern humans, reinforcing the notion of Homo floresiensis as a separate lineage within the human evolutionary tree. The evolutionary links between Homo floresiensis and Homo erectus provided additional insights into the origin of this enigmatic species. 
hypotheses proposing descent from Homo erectus populations that became isolated on Flores and subsequently underwent insular dwarfism found support in anatomical comparisons and archaeological evidence, such as stone tools found in the same strata as Homo floresiensis remains. Essentially, the controversy surrounding the classification of Homo floresiensis was due to the complexities inherent in paleoanthropology. While initial theories suggesting pathological conditions within modern humans offered plausible explanations for the unique traits of Homo floresiensis, the weight of morphological and genetic evidence ultimately favored its classification as a distinct species. On the topic of diet, Homo floresiensis had a diet that likely consisted of a variety of foods available in their island environment. Their diet was shaped by the resources around them and their ability to hunt and gather. Evidence suggests that Homo floresiensis hunted small to medium-sized mammals. Stone flakes and blades found in the region indicate tools used for slicing and stabbing, which were likely employed in hunting activities. The Homo floresiensis probably hunted animals like the stegodon, a dwarf species of elephant, which were abundant on the island. The burning marks on stegodon bones found in Liangbua Cave imply that Homo floresiensis hunted, butchered, and cooked these animals for consumption. In addition to meat, Homo floresiensis likely incorporated plant matter into their diet. Evidence of wood shaping on stone tools suggests that they may have used spears or traps for hunting, indicating an ability to utilize wood resources. Moreover, dental analysis of the collected specimens revealed wear patterns consistent with chewing tough, fibrous plant matter. This suggests that they consumed plant material as part of their diet potentially including a variety of fruits found in the jungles of Flores. Remarkably, Homo floresiensis, like other early humans, had the ability to control and use fire. At the excavation site, animal bones with signs of burning indicated that they had had cooked meat, making it more palatable and potentially safer to consume. Cooking would have been a significant advancement in their dietary habits, allowing for increased digestibility of food and potentially reducing the risk of foodborne illnesses. Essentially, the island of Flores was rich in biodiversity, with various birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects inhabiting its forests. While there is limited direct evidence of Homo floresiensis consuming these animals, it's plausible that they would have opportunistically consumed them as additional food sources. The lifestyle of Homo floresiensis was intricately woven into the unique paleo environment of the island of Flores. Imagine a landscape where volcanic mountains jut out from the center of the island, surrounded by lush tropical forests teeming with life. This was the world of the Flores Man, where sandy beaches met warm seas, and coral reefs provided a vibrant underwater ecosystem. In this natural paradise, Homo floresiensis roamed amidst clearings and caves using these natural features for their daily activities. Much like their larger mainland counterparts, Homo floresiensis were adept at tool use and technology. While their tools may not have been as advanced as those of later human species, they were effective for the tasks required in their environment. Stone flakes, blades, perforation tools, and points were crafted and used for hunting small to medium-sized mammals. Thanks to these tools, the early inhabitants of Flores were skilled hunters, employing spears and blades to close in on their prey. Evidence suggests that Homo floresiensis was also proficient in controlling fire. Animal bones found in the region show signs of burning, indicating that they were either cooked or held over a fire to make the meat more palatable. This mastery of fire would have provided warmth, protection, and the ability to cook food enhancing their survival in the challenging environment of Flores. Despite their ingenuity in tool use and fire control, there is little evidence to suggest that Homo floresiensis developed complex language. Instead, it is speculated that they communicated through a series of word-like sounds, including grunts, whoops, shouts, screams, and chitters. Thankfully, this basic form of communication would have sufficed for their social interactions and coordination during hunts. Although a paradise, the paleo environment of Flores was not without its dangers. See, the Homo floresiensis shared their habitat with formidable predators, most notably the infamous Komodo dragon. This apex predator, with its venomous bite and formidable size, posed a significant threat to the tiny Homo floresiensis. 
Essentially, conflict between the two species would have been inevitable, with Homo floresiensis likely seeking refuge in trees to escape the reach of the deadly reptiles. In addition to the Komodo dragon, other creatures of immense size roamed the forests of Flores. Leptopolis robustus, a giant stalk under the influence of island gigantism, shared the landscape with Homo floresiensis. While modern storks are mainly carrion feeders, the giant stalk of Flores may have posed a threat to the small hominins, potentially preying on young or sick members of the group. Island gigantism also extended to other inhabitants of Flores, including rats and even elephants. These oversized creatures, along with a myriad of other birds, reptiles, amphibians and insects, created a diverse and vibrant ecosystem. Homo floresiensis navigated this complex environment, hunting, gathering and adapting to the challenges presented by their surroundings. Overall, the lifestyle of Homo floresiensis was intricately intertwined with the paleo environment of Flores. From hunting and gathering to navigating the dangers of predation, these ancient inhabitants of the island showcased remarkable adaptability and resilience in the face of unique environmental challenges. So what happened to the species in the end? The extinction of Homo floresiensis, also known as the Flores Man, or the real-life hobbit, remains shrouded in mystery, much like many aspects of their existence. Today, two main theories attempt to shed light on why this species disappeared from the jungles of Indonesia. One theory states that the arrival of Homo sapiens on Flores may have contributed to the extinction of Homo floresiensis. As Homo sapiens migrated into the region, competition for resources likely intensified. This competition could have been detrimental to Homo floresiensis, especially if they were unable to compete effectively with the larger and more resource-intensive Homo sapiens. But that's not all, as conflict between the two species could have led to the demise of Homo floresiensis, whether through violent means or simply by being outcompeted for resources. Another theory suggests that environmental factors played a significant role in the extinction of Homo floresiensis. C. Flores is a volcanic island, prone to volcanic eruptions that could have devastated the island's ecosystem. These eruptions could have directly impacted Homo floresiensis by destroying their habitats, or indirectly by disrupting their food sources, such as the stegodons they relied upon. Additionally, Volcanic activity may have caused environmental changes that made survival more challenging for Homo floresiensis. Although they are now extinct, they live on in folklore, as the myth of the Abu Gogo adds an intriguing layer to the story. The Abu Gogo are described in Indonesian folklore as small, human-like creatures that inhabit the jungles of Flores. Multiple stories depict them as mischievous beings, stealing from settlements and even attacking children. According to legend, villagers attempted to eradicate the Ibu Gogo by luring them into a trap with gifts, ultimately leading to their demise in a blaze. While the Ibu Gogo myth predates the discovery of Homo floresiensis, some speculate that it may have originated from encounters with this ancient species. However, scientific evidence does not support the existence of Homo floresiensis in recent times, leaving the Ibu Gogo as a fascinating but likely fictional element of folklore. Today, Homo floresiensis remains a subject of speculation, with multiple theories saturating its story. From folklore to scientific dispute, they remain a confusing part of our family. And as we dig deeper into their lives, we begin to see the beauty of our evolution and how these small ancestors of ours left a not-so-small impact on our future. But what do you think about Homo floresiensis? What theories do you believe in? And do you think they still roam the jungle of Flores somewhere? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're at it, why not hit the like and subscribe button to learn more about the past? Until next time, bye.